Trafalgar Square, named after the Battle of Trafalgar 141805, is London's biggest and grandest public square. At this battle, the Royal Navy defeated a French and Spanish fleet, putting an end to French hopes of invading Britain and giving the Royal Navy command of the seas. Famously, the commander of the British fleet that day, Admiral Lord Nelson, was killed almost at the moment of victory. He is commemorated, of course, on Nelson's column, a giant Corinthian column carved in granite, which stands 172 feet high. It was paid for by public subscription and finished in 1842. At its base are four bronze reliefs which depict four of Nelson's greatest victories, the battles of St Vincent, the Nile, Copenhagen and Trafalgar. Surrounding the column are four huge lions, each weighing several tons. On a simple level, the square commemorates a British war hero on a site at the centre of the country's capital city. In the 19th century, of course, Trafalgar Square sat at the heart of the British Empire as much as it did London and the United Kingdom. Indeed, the naval superiority which Nelson secured at Trafalgar enabled Britain to expand and protect her empire for the next 100 years. The square's imperial legacy is still very much visible in some of the buildings which surround the square, in the imperial measurements which are preserved here, and in statues in the square which commemorate other heroes of the British Empire, one of which I discuss in another video. The reality is, however, not quite that simple at all. It was never the original intention that the square be named after the Battle of Trafalgar. That was only decided 20 years after the battle. The architect who laid out the square, Charles Barry, did not want Nelson's column raised in the square, and objections at the time meant that the column which we see is smaller than that originally planned. The reliefs and lions were only added another 20 years after the column went up. Trafalgar Square was not conceived then in its entirety as a memorial to British naval and imperial power. Its development was much more organic than that. The decades which passed between the Battle of Trafalgar and the naming of the square and the commemoration of Nelson were not simply a result of delays occasioned by meetings of planning committees. The fact is that Nelson was a very controversial figure in his own day. There can be no doubt that he was a hero to contemporary Britain. He was exceptionally successful, brave, single-minded and loved by the men under his command. When he died, the nation entered a period of mourning. Many of his fellow officers openly wept. Newspapers and journals printed eulogies and ballads in his honour. Huge crowds attended his funeral. His sacrifice, dying so that his fellow countrymen might live free, was compared in art and literature to Christ's and it did not take long even for relics to appear. At the same time, however, Nelson had what one of his biographers has called many less admirable characteristics. He was vain, stubborn and insecure. Most shockingly, he was a figure of public scandal. He treated his wife abominably, and he had at least two children with his married lover, Lady Hamilton. Indeed, for a period of two to three years, Nelson and the Hamiltons lived in a menage a trois, which led to mockery and their ostracism by much of polite society. For a generation or so after Trafalgar, Nelson was simply too controversial to be commemorated in the centre of London. Nowadays, what we would term Nelson's private life would barely cause a stir. More controversial would be his associations with slavery and imperialism. His wife Frances was born in the West Indies to a wealthy family who owned large numbers of black slaves. Britain's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade had been deep, and it was also closely bound up with the imperial project. Bit by bit, Britain had taken control of territory in both Africa and the Americas to facilitate the transfer of slaves and to profit from their labour. In the 150 or so years after 1662, more than three and a half million black Africans crossed the Atlantic in British slave ships, often in the most terrible of conditions. Nelson was not born into that colonial world, but he did marry into it and he did serve in the West Indies, protecting Britain's interests there. His victories also laid the foundations for Britain's 19th century dominance of the seas, 
enabling the expansion of Britain's empire. Can there be any redemption today for anyone associated, even if only vicariously or insignificantly, with slavery and imperialism? Again, however, things are not that simple. Depicted in this relief at the bottom of Nelson's column is a black sailor, quite possibly George Ryan. Ryan was one of at least 10 black sailors on board HMS Victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. We have no way of knowing how many black sailors served in the contemporary Royal Navy, but on some ships they may have accounted for as many as 20% of the crew. They are visible elsewhere. Daniel MacLeese's famous painting, The Death of Nelson, for example, depicts two black sailors. While black sailors did not usually serve as officers, in both the relief and the painting they are shown close to Nelson and in the heart of the action. Black sailors then not only played their part in Nelson's fleet, but their role was significant and well known enough to be commemorated in artwork in London's largest public square and in the Houses of Parliament. Moreover, the tide was already turning against slavery. Its legal status in Britain had been undermined, and two years after Nelson's death, Parliament passed the Act which abolished the slave trade in the British Empire. One year later, the Royal Navy's West Africa Squadron was established to prevent the transportation of slaves. Remarkably, freed slaves were now shipped back to Africa, where they landed at Freetown in Sierra Leone and walked through a freedom arch. Britain's naval superiority meant that over the course of the next 50 years, she was able to convince the French and bully the Spanish and Portuguese into prohibiting slaving and slavery as well. The British signed anti-slavery treaties with African rulers and deposed those who refused to outlaw the trade. British sailors were killed in action against slavers and perhaps 150,000 Africans were freed by Royal Navy ships. Thus, the same control of the seas which gave Britain imperial power also gave Britain the muscle to put an end to a transatlantic slave trade in which they had so recently played such an important part. Memorialisation in public spaces has always been contentious. The original intention was never to name the square after Trafalgar, and the architect who laid out the square was opposed to it housing Nelson's column. Victorian society knew that Nelson was a flawed hero, but he was lauded and commemorated all the same. Were they right to do this? Should we judge people by the best of their actions or by the worst? Should we even, imperfect as we all are, rush to judgment on anyone? After all, we all have our own failings, as did every single person commemorated on Nelson's column, from Nelson himself at the top to the black sailor at the bottom. In any case, if we are to judge, then who gets to pass judgment? Who decides what values we judge people against? We have also seen in this video that values and principles change over time. Today, few of us would be much troubled by the aspects of Nelson's character, which some of his contemporaries found unattractive, in the same way that many of his contemporaries would not be troubled by our misgivings about slavery and imperialism. Does that give us in the present the right to impose our principles and morals on the past? And if we do, should we then expect the same to be done to us in the future?